Welcome to Center Point Church. This is CPC in the Know. Is this your first Sunday at CPC? Welcome. And please stop back at the welcome desk and fill out a connection card so we can connect with you. The spiritual discipline for August is service. 2 Corinthians 9.12 says, For this ministry of service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. Hey teens, we're excited to invite you and a friend to Center Point Youth tonight at 6 o'clock. It's our back to school bash. It's going to be lots of fun. If you've got a white shirt that you don't mind getting dirty, you should wear it because we're going to have a crazy time. See you there. Hey, just wanted to let you know we're going to have a last minute change of location. Instead of CPC Youth Meeting at church tonight, we're going to meet at Pastor Joe and Emily's house. It's 1326 Summerlot Hoffman Road East, and that's Marion, Ohio. We hope to see you there. Directed Prayer is August 16th, starting at 5 p.m. Growth Night is also taking place on August 16th, starting at 6 p.m. Two options are available missions, and training for greeters and the welcome desk. The Time Apart Women's Conference is taking place Friday, September 25th. So ladies, be on the lookout for more information. If you have not had the chance to sign up to volunteer to serve here at CPC, visit the welcome desk and sign up in your area of interest. Thanks for coming to CPC. Welcome home. Morning, Center Point. Welcome this morning. How's everyone doing today? Are you out there? Yeah, I hear you. All right. You know what? This morning, I wanted to take a little time before we get started so I can just share a little bit of my heart and what I feel like the Lord is, is laying on it. So two weeks ago, I picked some songs and I felt like the Lord was saying, it's got to be all about me, which you're thinking like, Okay, so what's the difference? It's always all about him, right? True, but I don't know about you, but 2020 has been a little bit of a bear. I thank you for the one laugh. It's not been, it's not been a, a, a slice of cake, nothing that we've enjoyed. Maybe some of you are enjoying it. Don't get me wrong. Some of you may be living it and loving it. But I know that there are a lot in this room who are getting hit time and again. And it's a roller coaster. And you feel like just as, as we're feeling like we're getting better, but boom, we come crashing back down. And I've been reading through the Bible in a year, and um, I didn't find it happenstance that my devotional this morning was catered right to this thought that it needed to be all about God. So I wanted to take some time so that we can enjoy this full time of worship to talk to you really quickly about something in Second Chronicles. Jehoshaphat was terrified because the Israelites were under attack. And he said he needed to do the wisest thing that he possibly could. And what he said was he needed to seek the face of the Lord. And he needed to put himself flat down and he needed to fast and pray and worship. And he absolutely stated that God is bigger than enemy, any, any enemy force. And he was talking about the physical enemy that was upon them, right? Short swords, shields, they were coming after them. But we also know that there is an enemy that's seeking around like a hungry lion, seeking whom his next meal is, right? So he, rem he reminds, the Lord reminds him, though, that they have no need to fear or be dismayed, for the battle is not yours, it's the God's. So somebody here today needs to know the battle is not yours, and it's time to seek his face, and it's time to praise, and it's time to worship. When the enemy of your soul comes in for the attack, we should not fear. We should not be dismayed. We can do what the Israelites did, and they praised God in the presence of their enemy. And they sang, and the Lord set an ambush and rerouted the enemy. So this morning, is there a difficult situation you're facing? You better start singing. Even if you think you can't, you better start singing. Are you battling a diagnosis? I know I am. I'm going in for a little bit of a surgery on my back August 11th. Guess what? Sing songs of worship. Maybe you're leaving something in your past, a lifestyle that you're trying to change. And the enemy is trying to tempt you. You better sing of the greatness of God because guess what? It says we can do nothing without him, but all things are possible through him. 
And so this morning, I want to encourage you. This is a little bit more of a worship set. And I want to encourage you, if your act of worship this morning is in your seat, seeking the Lord, you do it. And if your act of worship this morning is standing up and shouting it out as loud as you can, you do it. If it's standing there and being silent and letting the Lord speak to you, do it. Be like Jehoshaphat and the Israelites this morning, and you sing in the presence of the enemy. And guess what? At that very name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So this morning, I want to start by, by singing the song, Build My Life. And I want to encourage us to just kick 2020, the enemy, in the face and say, we welcome you here this morning, Jesus. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever
we need you this morning. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So teach. So teach my song to rise. Temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my soul to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Because Jesus, you're my hope and stay. That's good news. you make us strong and we need you Father God Lord that that song would rise to you this morning Lord we cannot stand Father God that we wouldn't just fall but that we would fall on you Oh 
Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. We sing, come Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord, someone needs to hear this. Oh, not for a minute were you forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. So come Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. God, with our voices and with our mouths, we declare the Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Regardless of what others say, regardless of what the enemy would want us to do or say or know, the Lord is in this place. We declare that we are the people of the King. We are the people of God. Hallelujah. Greater is he that is in us and upon us and around us who gives us breath and life than anyone outside of us. Lord, we declare you're greater, you're stronger, you're mightier, you're powerful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord, that we have a reason to worship this morning. We have a reason to rejoice. We have a reason to give you praise. Hallelujah. 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 One more time. Come on, church. Just give him praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Lord is in this place. Lord is in this place. Lord is in this place. touch in your body, whatever is more comfortable. If you need a, a full on onslaught from heaven, just put your hand on your head. Um, if if it, maybe it's not quite that critical, you put your hand on your heart. <laughs> but God, I want more right now, Lord. We just bring ourselves into your presence for healing, for encouragement, for strength, for cleansing, God for moral courage. We bring ourselves into your presence. We thank you, Lord. We, we just give praise that you're healing us. You're redeeming us. You're renewing us. You're strengthening us. Hallelujah. You're providing for us in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. And you're preparing us. You're preparing us for a day when we're going to see you face to face and forever we're going to live in your presence. You're also preparing us for the days in between that day and now where we're going to represent you well on earth, even in the midst of the struggles and trials and tribulations of 2020. Thank you, Lord, that you're preparing us, equipping us, and anointing us and setting us apart for your sake. In Jesus' name, be whole in Jesus' name. Be whole in Jesus' name. You look good. You look good. God bless you. You can be seated. Our ushers are coming um, to begin to set in place the giving stations for you. As always, you're welcome to give in person during the service. Um, continue to. It's, it is not an issue for us. Welcome to Center Point in Church. Your, this is um, CP. You're giving by... Um, mail or whether you text to give or give on the website. Um, if you ever have any issues with that, um, you can reach out either to my uh, personal email address or the church's email address is info at discovercenterpoint.com. We're monitoring that pretty regularly. So that's info at discovercenterpoint.com. Jesus, thank you that you are our provider and that you are a blessing to the people of God. And that your, your, your provision not only, Lord, is meeting the needs 
but it's more than enough so that they can be generous to meet the needs of others. Thank you for that, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And all of Centerpoint, we're going to start off this morning with the BGMC offering. So if you've got some buddy barrels or anything, bring it on down. I know we have it. There we go. Come on, fill it up. Last week, the kiddos raised $40, so there's 60 more dollars to be raised this week and next week for Mr. Greg and myself to have something a little crazy happen to us. We haven't figured out what that is yet. Get our offering in. That's right, they've been working hard. All right. All right. So this morning, if you are in eighth grade or under, I want you to listen. Up. I know it's normally fifth grade and under, but I'll talk to little older kids today. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to know the answer. So, let's see. I, you're pretty, pretty sure you'll get it. Okay, I, I need to ask, what is this? Yell it out. There we go. It's a trash can. So, if this trash can had nasty banana peels and um, soda cans and yucky donuts in it, what would we do with it? What would we do with that trash? Should we just leave it there all the time? Just yell it out. We would take out the trash, right? Because it would stink. Okay, so the same is true with our minds. Sometimes We've got some stinky thinking. I like to call it stinking thinking. And we get some trash thoughts. What are those trash thoughts? Well, it could be a scary thought, an angry thought, a sad thought, a bad thought about somebody you know. We get them as, as younger kids. We get them as teens. We get them as older kids. This goes to everybody. But the Bible tells us exactly how to take out the trash of our minds. So we're going to... Go to Philippians chapter 4. Can someone yell out Philippians chapter 4? All right. Perfect. Perfect. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, and learn how to take that trash out. It gives us three things that we can do. First, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, Present your request to God. So the first thing to take the trash out is we have to pray. Give it to God. Give our thoughts to God. Say, God, this is all I'm thinking. This is all I need. This is what's going on. Let's take it out and give it to God. The second thing is, after we take out the trash, if this is our minds, we should probably put a new bag in it, right? So, yeah. So it says, and the peace of God, which covers all understanding, will guard your heart and mind. So, sissy, when we put this trash bag in here, it guards the trash can, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're going to take our requests, our thoughts to Jesus. We're going to put a new trash bag on, and his peace is going to cover our hearts and minds. And then it tells us exactly what to do. So if this bin was not filled with trash, but was filled with a bunch of prizes, it would turn into kind of like a treasure chest, right? If it was full of prizes, it wouldn't be a trash can. It'd be a treasure chest. So the Philippians says about our mind, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So when we take out the trash... We can actually change what's in our mind by thinking about all of the good things that God tells us to think about. So we're going to do faith at home this week. Is If you have stinking thinking, if you've got thoughts, we're going to take those thoughts and we're going to give them to Jesus. And then we're going to ask his peace to cover us. And we're going to think about good things this week. All right.
So let's pray. Can you guys pray with me? Father, we thank you for the kids of Center Point, the ones who are here and the ones who aren't, God. You see them, you know where their hearts are today. And so, God, I ask that you would cover them, Lord. Any stinking thinking about what's to come in the next school year or what friends they might make or what's going on in the world, God, we ask that right now they would present those requests to you, God, that we at home would teach them and garner their little hearts and minds to be covered by your peace. Lord, I ask that we would do it as an example in this church, that we would always point to you the pure, lovely, and good report thoughts that cover their hearts and minds. We cover them in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus came on the scene um, in uh, an era and time that uh, perhaps didn't have the same challenges we have today, but there were certainly a lot of challenges in Jesus' day. And I just want you to know that um, God isn't afraid of the difficult days. Um, He is convinced that um, sending his son into the midst of the difficulty is the best thing that can happen. Um, And so I want you to know that it is God's heartbeat and his purpose to um, let his presence and his and his, uh, the atmosphere of heaven be very, very, very um, noticeable, very, uh, to, to, to be aware of that. He wants you to be aware of that. He wants you to be aware of his presence. And, and this morning already, we've, we've sensed his presence. And we're going to ask that God's going to continue to, to amp up that um, nearness and that, um, that commitment to walk into the midst of our lives and make his, his presence sensed and known and felt. Um, the Great Commission in the New Testament has, is presented so many different ways. Jesus gives the command, go and make disciples of every nat- uh, nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. He, that's probably the one we, we claim most. But this passage in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, that you heard in the video and you see on the screen, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Think about that passage of scripture. Um, put yourself in Jesus's um, shoes. Put yourself in the, the, the pre-disciples' shoes. Jesus is walking along the seashore, and he sees um, groups of fishermen. And he simply says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And some of the other um, gospels, it, he doesn't even add I will make you fishers of men. He just says, come and follow me. Jesus comes into the midst of their situation and he gives them an invitation. Verse 17, verses 16, 17, and 18, I want to read them so that you've got the whole um, context. Mark chapter 1, verses 16, 17, and 18 says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. I would say to you this morning that Jesus is coming to you and he's asking you to come. He's asking you to follow him. He's inviting you to be remade. And he's inviting you to the family business, the kingdom of heaven family business, and that is to bring lost people home to the Father, to make you fishers of men. I think it's amazing that Jesus just interrupts their day and says, come. What's the response? 
What's the response going to be? Put yourself in Jesus' shoes. What are, they, what are they going to do? He says, follow me. What happens if they don't follow him? What happens if they ignore him? What if he's standing on the seashore yelling, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men? And, and they're just like, say what? And they just go back to their business. I think it's obvious that there are many, many times those of us in this room have been distracted when Jesus came into the midst of our daily routine and we didn't see him, we didn't notice him. If we heard him, we were so distracted we didn't respond. But in this instance, Jesus just simply says, come, and immediately he has those men's attention. And I think it's amazing, Mark 1.18 describes the response. At once, at once, they left their nets and followed him. Think, think for a minute what, what that entails. I mean, would you put yourself in their shoes? Would you have responded that quickly? Would it have been at once? Or give me a few minutes, <laughs> right? Um, what, what was it about that invitation that moved those disciples to drop what they were doing and to obey a command to a person that either perhaps they didn't know at all or only knew in passing. Perhaps they had seen him before. Um, there's some accounts that, that place this call after there's been an encounter with, with Jesus. We don't know the timing of it. But no matter what, even a good friend of yours coming over to your house and interrupting your yard work or interrupting um, your day at work and they say, come, follow me. And you say, well, I'm kind of busy, you know, I'm in the middle of something. It's amazing to me that their response is, and at once, they left their nets and followed him. Now, I want to I jump in to the midst of this and, and do a little bit of teaching and maybe help you understand some things about yourself and understand some things about how God wants to use you to be the one on the shore calling people to follow Jesus, calling people to a life of being fishers of men, calling people home to the Father, because that is why God has saved us and filled us with the Holy Spirit, is to do precisely that. Anybody ever fish? I like to fish. Sometimes I just like to drown worms. Sometimes I just like to be bored. Sometimes I just like to watch the dragonflies. Um, sometimes I just like to go through um, 15 hours of preparation ahead of time um, to catch absolutely nothing. But I always really want to go where the fish are biting. It's a little bit more fun. You have a little bit more to talk about, to be able to go where the fish are biting. Jesus had the ability, because he was a good fisher of men, just like folks, I guess, that are really good anglers, they know where the fish are biting. Jesus knew where the people were. Jesus went where the fish were biting. And, and I, as, I, as I state that, Jesus went where the fish are biting. I have a question for you. Are you? Are you a fish that's biting? Are you? I think that's the first place that we need to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts concerning when Jesus comes into our midst, when he shows up, however that is, through worship this morning, 
through th this message, hopefully, this morning, through a phone call, through a fellow believer, through a stranger, through a passing thought that comes through your mind and you know it's anointed by the Holy Spirit. Whatever means it might be, as you're seeking God's face, and he, he shows up and he comes to where you're at and he's at your seashore. He's at your place of busyness. You're preoccupied with something and Jesus interrupts. Are you one of those who are ready to take the hook? Are you one of those who are ready to drop everything and, and listen? Sometimes we get a little bit, um, we, we overthink things. Jesus, I think, said so precious little because there's too many of us that overthink things. Come and follow me. That was enough in some of the Gospels to move people towards Jesus. I wish I could recruit that way with three words. Come follow me. Come on, come sign up for worship. Come sign up for children's ministry. Come, come, come serve the church. I wish, I wish I was that good of a recruiter. Come follow me. But there's something about the simplicity and briefness of that statement is that if you understand who is giving you the invitation, you all are immediately you are at attention. It's Jesus on the shore. If you don't really know who Jesus is, you don't really care about who he is. If, you're, if, if what you're doing, if your life in front of you is more important than, than who God is, then you probably are not going to notice that he has interrupted your life. But there was something about these men. They were hungry for more from God. They were, there's an expectancy. And where so many others had casual acquaintances and meetings with Jesus, these men had something in their heart. They were, they were hungry. They were ready to take the bait. They were ready to bite. They were fish that Jesus could catch. Are you? Are you a fish that Jesus can catch. I'm going to turn it around a little bit because in order for you to be a good fisherman, you need to be first caught by Jesus. You need to be hungry because your hunger and your willingness and your obedience, your quick yes to the Lord because you're just amazed and infatuated by who he is. You're just blown away that God would stop and interrupt your day. You're just, it's a privilege that God would say anything to you and invite you to do anything. That passion gets translated as you invite others. The question is, are you a good fisherman like Jesus is? Jesus is inviting us to learn, and he is in that process of teaching us to be good fishermen. But I, I want to ask this question. Are you fishing where the fish are biting? Jesus did. Are you fishing where the fish are biting? Just let that sink in for just a minute. So I'm going to invite you, if you have your Bibles, to look at another passage of Scripture. If you'll turn to Luke chapter 10. I don't have all of this up on the screen because there's several verses. And if I put it all up there on one slide, you probably would struggle to see it from where you're sitting anyways. But if you don't have a copy of the Scriptures, just listen as I read. Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. Uh, this is another in, uh, account of Jesus inviting people to fish, the Great Commission. After the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place he was about to visit. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 
Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Carry no purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone along the road. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> okay. How many, how many of us would follow that direction, right? Do not greet anyone along the road. Whatever house you enter, begin by saying peace to this house. I guess maybe in the COVID environment, we would be fine with that, right? We put our masks on and scurry on by. If a man of peace, verse 6, and this is what I really want you to hear. It says, it says verse 5, whatever house you enter, begin by saying peace to this house. Verse 6, if a man of peace is there, a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay at the same house, eating and drinking whatever you're offered, for the worker is worthy of his wages. Do not move around from house to house. If you enter a town and they welcome you, eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near. He, uh, it, but if you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go into the streets and declare, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off as a testimony against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. There's a, a, a phrase in there that talks about a man of peace. And I would like to use a phrase that someone else has, has already coined, a person of peace. A person who is ready to receive the gospel, a person who is ready to take and bite on the hook that Jesus cast to them, is a, is a person of peace. It's a person who opens their heart. It's the person that when Jesus says, come, they, they stop what they're doing. He says, follow me. And they, they begin to move. Oftentimes, we will focus in on the group that is ignoring us. So the person that we say come to and they begin to move, we go, we've got them. Now let's, let's just bear in on those that aren't. And we say it again, come. We say it again, come a little bit louder. Don't you want to come? And I'm not for an instant here saying that it, you, myself, and so many others need mercy and grace repetitively. But I am trying to make a point. We think that continuing to invite people who are ignoring us or are not paying any attention is the way to go. Jesus looked for the people who would come and respond, and then the people, you know how that goes. They weren't paying any attention, and all of a sudden, two people are dropping their, their nets, and they're moving, and all of a sudden, everybody's talking. Where are they going? What are they doing? I wonder, what, what, I wonder if they've got cookies there or something. What, what's going on? What's, what, did I miss something? And immediately, the curiosity peaks. Why? Because the movement of one person coming to Christ is attractive to others. And so Jesus knew that about human nature. He, he was a master at, at, at calling people. He was, he was a master at understanding what to say and what not to say. And I want to I be a fisherman like Jesus. I want to be an evangelist like Jesus. I want to be a, a person that can bring people to home to the Father like Jesus was. And so I think it's important that we understand how he did what he did and what he did. He knew that the truth was powerful enough that if anybody had ears to hear, they would hear it. And oftentimes, Paul's response, because he was first to respond, when maybe Jerry and Gordy, they were talking about uh, playing um, Rook or something. But because Paul starts coming, they're like, hey, wait a minute, where's Paul going? They were influenced and touched because 
somebody else started moving. And Jesus, Jesus was fine with that. Jesus was fine with, with just calling people and inviting people because he knew that the truth was powerful, the truth would, would persuade, the invitation was there, and that if the presence of God is in that place good things are going to happen. That's also why he gave you the ammunition he gave you. Notice, we talk about heaven. We proclaim the kingdom of heaven is there. We heal the sick, right? And we drive out devils. What's all that about? That's to get, Paul already came, but that's to get Jerry and Gordy and Brent to come now. That's to get us to come. That's to open up our hearts and our eyes. As sometimes Jesus said it himself that, 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 you, you will only believe if you see a sign. So Jesus was willing, all his ministry, to give people signs. And he was willing to give people miracles. He was willing to heal the sick. He was willing to do amazing things. <laughs> Why? Because he knew that the truth, he knew that his presence, he knew that heaven, if he could just get their attention, that you don't even really need to know what fishers of men is going to look like. You're already probably not going to follow Jesus. If you need to know the day, the time, what you're going to get paid, how long the commitment is, and, and what color socks you should wear that day. If you need all that information, you probably aren't going to say yes. But because of who he is, and because that tug of truth and that tug of, the, of heaven is, is on that invitation, we start moving regardless. I really don't care where he's calling me. I'm just going to go because I love him. I just, I need him. And there's, there's something about that, that that Jesus understood. And he gives that instruction in Luke chapter 10. One more place because we've got to wrap this up now. And that's in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 15. This is an example of, of Paul ministering. I apologize for um, what's happening with our uh, proclaim today. Um, I loaded those slides, and um, I'm not sure what we did, what we did, but it just doesn't want to stay up very long. Um, Acts chapter 16, if you've got your Bibles, you want to turn and look at it, verses 6 through 15, and I'll start reading. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And let me just pause and say, there is, when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to fishing and catching people, it needs to be spirit-led. You need to ask the Lord to direct you to who to speak to. Verse 7, when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they're on their way. They're trying to figure out where to go, but they didn't just dig their heels in. They, they listened to the Holy Spirit, and they kept moving. So they passed by and went down to Troas. Verse 9, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Paul is trying to do what God's called him to do, and he's also trying to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that when you're moving and trying to hear the voice of God, always expect he's going to speak. He's going to give you a vision. He's going to speak to your heart. He's going to direct you. He's going to give you that nudge. You're just going to know that you know that you know that God is in this moment. And that's what Paul felt. And so verse 11, from Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day, we went to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. And one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. 
And when the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home, her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Lydia was one of those fish that were biting. Lydia was one of those persons of peace. One of those first responders. All Jesus needed to say is, come, follow me. She was there. There's something about those people that God chooses because they carry their passion for God, carries an influence that will gather others. Think about the apostles. What did the apostles do? They gathered a whole host of others. They were, they were following after Jesus, and because they followed after Jesus, others followed them as he, they followed Jesus. Lydia, we find out, is really the church founder for that area. Paul planted a church in Lydia's home. And it grew. And it was blessed. And people came to Jesus because of Lydia's hunger, because she was a person of peace. And God allowed that initial hunger and that initial acceptance of the Lord to be, to be multiplied in many others. You know what? Paul didn't win everybody. In even in, in, in the surrounding area of Lydia's house. A lot of those people were family members that came to Christ because Lydia came to Christ. A lot of those people were, were second and third and fourth generation Christians. Paul didn't win all of them, but because he was led by the Holy Spirit to those who were hungry, to those who were biting, to those persons of peace, God began to spread through them the gospel through the cities and the countryside. So I want to ask you a question. Are you a person of peace? Commit to being a person of peace to the Lord, first of all. You're never going to be a great fisher of men if you're not first a hungry um, fish that has a great appetite for the things of God. You're not going to find persons of peace Unless you're first a person of peace. Commit to being the one that can be interrupted. Commit to the one who doesn't have to have a list of all the things that this is going to look like. Just say, Lord, whatever you ask, I'm all, all in because I love you. I love you, Lord. You could ask me to do the craziest thing in the world, but I love you, King. I'm, I'm all in. Fishers of men, I don't even know what that looks like. I know what fishing for fish looks like. But I don't need to know, as long as you are calling me, I'm all in. Commit to be that person. And then ask the Holy Spirit to direct you to be, to direct you to people of peace, persons of peace. The enemy's really good at sidetracking us. And notice that Paul is on his way. He's got lots of opportunities to stop and share the gospel. And it would have, I'm sure there was a struggle there. I'm sure there's times that we're on our way and there's a struggle, should I share? And, and, and sometimes, you know what, if we don't have specific direction from God, I think we do share. I think we, we meet the need of the people in front of us and we, we heal the sick and we, we share the gospel. But always be people who are open to the voice of God because as you were going, God wants you to be a great fisher of men. He wants you to bring sons and daughters home. So listen, and Paul's listening. And Jesus says, don't stop here, don't stop here, go here. Because Lydia ended up, that gospel movement, that, that church plant movement in, in, in the, the provinces of Asia were, were, were brought really into existence because Paul followed the leading of the Holy Spirit to the right people and it exploded. We've got we to ask the Lord, who in our community is hungry. Who in our, you know, sometimes the, we begin to say to, to, to a person and they stand up in the boat and we're like, 
Yeah, they're first responders. They're probably not serious about it. They're, they're dropping their stuff in. We're ignoring the people that are lining up and want to be helpful. And we're chasing down the people who haven't raised their hand. One more time. I know you're out there. You're going to raise your hand. I just know it before we go. And we got 15 people up front going, what about me? Do you hear what I'm saying? I, we, we, there's a balance here. And I'm, and I'm overbalanced on one side right now to try to help us because... Because we, we sometimes, we just take a bag of seed and we just wing it everywhere. And, and then we get discouraged because all that seed that we planted doesn't grow. And Jesus is like, this is a spiritual thing, buddy boy. Come on, Brent. You'll do a lot better if you just follow my leadership and my direction. And then the third question, or the third challenge is, Will you invest in people for heaven's sake? Will you invest in people for heaven's sake? Jesus is asking you to come. Jesus is asking you to follow him. Jesus is asking you to be remade. Jesus is calling you to a specific profession. And that has to do with bringing sons and daughters home to the king. Bringing lost and wayward people home to the father. To be fishers of people, fishers of men. Are you willing? I invite you to stand this morning. Hallelujah. Are you hanging on every word Jesus is saying? Come on now. Amen. You're hanging on every word Jesus is saying? That's step one. That's step one. How do I get to be the fisher of men? It's the first step. It's the, it's the drop what you're doing and listen. It's the, it's the come. It's just come. Lift up your head. Open your heart. What's the first step? To have an appetite. For the voice of God. Have an appetite for the things of God. Be hungry. I'm going to ask that question again. How many of you are hungry for God? How many of you are hungry for the things of God? How many want to hear His voice? How many have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to you right now? That's it, guys. That's it. That's it. Just listen now. Listen to what the Holy Spirit's telling you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Say, God, I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm able. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I'm willing to respond. Hallelujah. Thank you that you've invited me to come. Thank you that you've invited me to be a part of the greatest endeavor on the planet. And that's to bring people to Jesus Christ. Thank you that you promised you're going to teach me. You're going to make me. You're going to make me. Declare that over your life. If you have to say it out loud, say it out loud. God, you are making me a fisher of men. You're making me a fisher of men. All I've got to do is follow you. All I've got to do is follow you, and you will make me a fisher of men. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I confess, Lord, that I am a person of peace. I desire to be a person of peace at all times. And I'm asking you, Lord, to open my eyes to see like-minded people, people that are out there, people that just, they're, they're waiting. They want to be touched by God. Hallelujah. God, anoint me so that I can use the tools that you've given me. God, there's sometimes that the person of peace is, is covered up in, in sickness and illness, but Lord, you've given me healing to wake up that person. You've given me acts of kindness to wake up that person. You've given me the words from the mouth of God to wake up that person. Might be as simple as come might be as simple as follow me. Whatever that word might be, those messages and words from God, God, give them to us so that we can speak them in obedience. 
in Jesus' name. And I thank you for an anointing, God, that there is in this day and time that we live in that you are doing something in our hearts that's transforming us and changing us so that we can be followers of Jesus, so that we can be the fishers of men. And Lord, we want to take that first step. We don't want to worry about whether or not um, there's a mask mandate, whether or not people are comfortable going to church if we invite them. God, we just want the next step. We want the next person of peace. We want that next opportunity. And we're not going to limit what you want to do in these days and times. There are people that you have already marked. God, send, send us to them. Send them across our paths. Help us to see the hungry hearts. Help us to hear the quick yes, the response. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I want to bless you. I want to bless you with a heart after the Lord that is, is, is so um, intensified that you're going to question, how did I ever serve God without what he's just given me? So Lord, I bless your people with a renewed passion, intensity, hunger, ears to hear, a heart to run after you in Jesus' name. I pray, God, they'll be, they'll be putting their running shoes on. Jesus is here. Let's go. I pray that in Jesus' name that you're going to do that in their heart, that they're going to be more in love and more trusting and more obedient for, to God than they've ever been in their life. In Jesus' name, we give you praise for it. And God's people said, amen. Amen. I love you. Be great fishers of men. We've got a great teacher, right? He's the best. Amen.